Uh, hello, everybody. My name's Amy Foster. Welcome to Women in the Word. It's great to see you all here. Love being with you here. You know, when I was growing up, I had a, a little Bible. It was called a Children's Illustrated Bible, and it was full of beautiful watercolors. And as we've been studying numbers, I've been thinking, I don't remember any of the watercolors from my little Bible. And then I realized, oh, they would scare the children. It would be terrifying if there were a bunch of illustrations from the book of Numbers, because they would all be a crowd of angry people yelling at Moses and yelling at God. And so as I let my imagination sort of shape that picture, it's just a mass of humanity out there in the desert and they've all got their dark skin and their dark hair and they're screaming at Moses. And in my imagination, if you look right into the middle of the crowd, there's one fair skinned lady with blonde curly hair. <laughs> and she is short, but her fist is right up there with everybody else's. Every page I turn and every chapter I'm afraid there's gonna be a picture of me. <laughs> but what we'd really see if we illustrated these chapters, um, every chapter there's a picture of an unbelievably gracious God, always going before his children. You know, the book of Numbers, it's telling us the history of the nation of Israel, but it is not a history lesson. It's a theology lesson. Through their history, God is teaching us important theological truths, and the number one truth is holy God is gracious God. And we keep seeing that as he interacts with his people. He gives what they don't deserve, he gives what they can never earn, and he does it over and over and over again, because all along this path that they're treading to get to the promised land, they rebel. And over and over again, they fall short of God's holy standard. And it's like God just keeps going out before them, laying a paved stone in front of them in the wilderness, paving the way for them with grace because they are never quite deserving of what God is doing for them. And God's grace goes out to take them to the land of promise. So when we consider the Israelites, I always want us to consider God has rescued his people out of Egypt and he's redeemed them to be a people for himself. And then he takes them to Sinai and he gives them a new identity. They are no longer slaves. They are children of the most high God. And their identity includes they're to be his people, they're to bear his name, they're to live in his presence, and they're to be holy because he is holy. And now God is training them to live out that identity and their training like ours includes some failures and some discipline along the way. At the core of their, of, of their training is this idea, all of life is spiritual. All of life is God's. Not just the part that happens on the Sabbath or the part that happens in the tabernacle. It's all God's and the basic rule for that spiritual life is always the same. Sin and disobedience defiles people and separates them from God. Sin must be dealt with for people to have a relationship with God and to be in his presence. So God uses all kinds of daily experiences and symbols to teach his people these truths and he asks for obedience in all of these trainings. And he asks for obedience not because he wants them to be good performers, because he wants these truths ingrained in their hearts and ingrained in their brains so that they will behave like their truth, so that they will begin to live out their new identity. What he's teaching them in chapter 19 is some important truths about sin, and he's really teaching them the symbolism of death. And God is a very clever teacher, using the most teachable moment, because if you remember from last week what just happened to the Israelites, they rebelled against God, and 14,000 died on the spot. Ladies, there are dead bodies everywhere. And as they wander through the wilderness, during their discipline years, one, two whole generations are going to die. No one in this traveling group is going to escape the presence of death. And so God uses this teaching opportunity to teach them some truths about death. So we're gonna begin in Numbers 19. And just a few verses here that, that lay the foundation. Uh, verse 11, whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean for seven days. 
And verse 14, this is the law when someone dies in a tent. Everyone who comes into the tent and everyone who is in the tent shall be unclean for seven days. Every open vessel that has no cover fastened on it is unclean. And whoever is in the open field and touches someone who was killed with a sword or who died naturally or who touches a human bone or a grave shall be unclean for seven days. So what God is instituting here is some laws. Any contact with a dead body rendered an Israelite unclean. Unclean always means cut off from fellowship with God, cut off from the people of God and the presence of God. And we have to remember here, physical death always represents the ultimate consequence of sin. That's always what it's representing. And think back with me, Adam and Eve in the garden. Death was not a reality until Adam and Eve sinned. So death always represents the consequence of judgment for sin. Romans 6.23, I've included this on your verse sheet, for the wages of sin is death. That's what God is teaching here. So he's instituting laws, and among all his other laws, death, contact with a dead body, really communicates the highest level of impurity because it's communicating contact with the sin that corrupts and defiles and destroys forever. So any contact with a dead body defiled God's people, and the only way they could come back into community with God was to be cleaned, to be purified. And what God is showing them, they have absolutely no capacity to purify or clean themselves here, but God can do it, and God is willing to do it, and that's why he institutes these laws, and he asks the people to follow these laws with faith. And so what we see about God here, the beautiful illustration we have of him, is God makes a way for us unclean people to become clean. They can't do that for himself, so it's only his grace. And his means here, as he's teaching him in the Old Testament, was that they would sacrifice an animal. In this instance, it's specifically a red heifer. And after they were done sacrificing, they would burn the animal's body. They would gather up those ashes and store them somewhere. And whenever someone had contact with, an un, with a dead body and became unclean, they would use these ashes, they would mix them with some water, and someone would sprinkle those ashes over them two different times and that made the unclean person clean. So what we have to stop and pay attention in this uh, teaching is the water isn't magic. The water has no power in it whatsoever. The water cannot wash away the consequences of rebelling and being disobedient towards God. Only God can do that. He's the one who's been violated. He's the only one who can take away the consequence. And what we see here is God is willing. He is willing to do what only he can do because of his grace. It's such a picture of his grace. During the Old Testament, um, the system of sacrifices was the way people would be forgiven and, and would approach God again. But the people have to demonstrate their belief that God's words are true, that God would cleanse them if they followed the statutes, if they sacrificed that heifer, if they mixed the ashes with the water, if they submitted to someone sprinkling that over them. Today, Jesus gives us another way. He gives us you know, we have Jesus as our perfect and final sacrifice. Jesus was offered on the cross in our place, but we share something in common with this Old Testament system. It's never enough to simply know God's truth. It's never enough to be surrounded and numbered among God's people. God requires a response of faith from everyone from everyone, and we read in these verses that the person who refused to submit to this, the person who wasn't sprinkled with those ashes, they were cut off from God, they were cut off from the people, they were put outside the camp, and what's implied there is the death penalty for them. So the theological truth that we can take from this today is just like Israel, it's not enough for us to surround ourselves with the truths of God and the people of God, we too must have a response of faith. God's provided the means for our sin and for our uncleanness to be purified. We can't do it on our own. It's an act of grace, but we must receive it. We must respond to it. 
Romans 10.9 describes that response. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so we have such a picture of God who is our holy and, and severe judge, but also God who is full of grace and mercy. Psalm 103 describes him. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Mercy means God withholds what we deserve, the punishment, the eternal separation from him. God withholds it, but grace means he gives what we don't deserve, the right to be his people and live in his presence and have our sins forgiven. So God is teaching them that he is a God of grace, but he's also teaching them some things they need to know about themselves. And he's teaching us some things we need to know about ourselves. We will constantly need God's grace. We always will need it. What I want you to know as we shift from chapter 19 to chapter 20, there's a 38-year gap here um, in, in the cycle. There's also a, a, a literary cycle that goes all through the book of Numbers, and it begins to repeat again here, and I'm going to tell you what it's called, and you're immediately going to understand it's called a rebellion cycle. That's what they've described it. And so we keep seeing the same cycle of rebellion repeat. So we go back into, we go from a teaching cycle now into a rebellion cycle. And God is teaching him, teaching them and showing them how every single one of them will always need his grace. Another important thing I want you to keep in mind, everything we read in these next two chapters, it happens in the 40th year of the wilderness wandering. And that's pretty significant, isn't it? Um, we know that later because we're told in chapter 33 that when Aaron dies, it was the fifth month of the 40th year. So this is year 40. And don't you know, the younger generation has been counting down the days. Can you imagine the New Year's Eve party when the 39th year was over and it was the 40th year here in the desert, I want you to consider what they might be anticipating, what they might be feeling. Maybe some of them are feeling great relief that they're finally approaching the end of this desert wandering. Maybe some of them are full of anticipation. Maybe there's fear, because remember there's giants in that land that they're gonna go into. Probably there's some weariness, probably a great deal of grief. Everyone over the age of 60 has almost completely died by now. If, if there are a few left, they're in their last months, and they know that. So that's where this story picks up. Open your Bibles with me. We're gonna begin reading chapter 20 in verse one. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought this assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. So they go back to Kadesh, and the first thing that happens there is Miriam dies, and I think her death is a pretty sobering experience. I think her death is an obvious reminder that everyone from the older generation that failed to believe God and trust God and obey God and enter the promised land, they would all experience God's judgment, they would all die without entering the land. And that's discouraging, and then God allows another discouraging thing to happen, Kadesh is normally well watered, and they know that because they have been in Kadesh before. This is where they were when they sent the spies out to check out the land. And when they come back here, they are expecting water, but there's no water in Kadesh, and the grumbling starts again. Now, in their defense, we have to point out water is a vital necessity for all of us. I'm sure they were thinking every moment of every day about what would be the water supply source for this many people, millions of people traveling each day. And I want you to consider by putting water-dependent people in a desert for 40 years, what is God trying to teach them? He's trying to teach them that they need him 
and he will meet their need. And he teaches them that over and over and over again, but just like us, they're quick to forget. So this argument amused me just a little bit. Um, They've changed their tune a little bit, but they really are singing the same song every time. They used to say it would be better if we died in Egypt. Well, now they're saying it would be better if we died in our brother's rebellion. Do you remember the rebellion we discussed last week? 14,000 died in an instant. They're saying it would be better if God killed us like that. They used to say, um, we're going to die and our children. Now they say, we're going to die and even our cattle too. So maybe some hyperbole here. And I found this amusing. This evil place has no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates. It's like, ah, no figs, grapes, or pomegranates here. (laughs) Basically, they're saying this is not the promised land. And they're right. It's not. But do you remember when those spies went into the promised land? I've included this verse for you, Numbers 13, 23. When they came back to tell them how good that land was, the grape cluster was so large, two people had to carry it. And they brought back figs and pomegranates. I think that's so funny that they're demanding that the place that they are right now should have all the blessings of the promised land. Kadesh is not the promised land, but it is exactly where God wants them to be at this time. And if they doubt that for a moment, all they have to do is look up because the cloud is still with them. The cloud is leading them every single day, showing them the direction, the presence, the power of God. But instead, they call the place where God has directed them evil. And I have to consider, don't I do this too? When the circumstances in my life are not to my liking, when I am uncomfortable, I do assume I'm not supposed to be here. Things are supposed to be good for me. Things are supposed to always be getting better for me. But sometimes the uncomfortable places are exactly where we're supposed to be. Sometimes this is exactly where God has led us so we can learn to depend on him, so we can learn who he is. Years ago, I had a significant financial reversal in my life, and my sons and I had to change just about everything about the way we lived, and I will admit to you, sometimes that felt like an evil experience because it was just so uncomfortable. And maybe you've experienced a financial reversal and can understand that, or maybe you've experienced a reversal in your good health You know, when good health begins to deteriorate, we can feel the same way. Or when good relationships sour and go badly. Our human tendency is to be shocked and to assume that something is wrong. I think our American tendency is to assume that we should always be living a better and a better and a better life. Fortunately, in my economic downturn, I had uh, great friends around me who reminded me of the truths of God. I had one friend who kept humor in front of my eyes all the time, and she gave me this little set of paper napkins to make me laugh, and I kept one of them. It's been 15 years. I want to show you a picture of it. Can you see it up there? If I keel over in Walmart, drag my body to Neiman's. Okay, it's a joke. Nobody get offended. I'm not saying anything good or bad about Walmart or Neiman's here. But you get the idea. Walmart is economical and no frills, and Neiman's is sort of exclusive and luxurious. You know, if if you're shopping in Neiman's on a warm day, they're going to bring you a bottle of cool water. And if you're dying of thirst in Walmart, they're going to tell you, yeah, you can get a whole case at the top aisle 16, help yourself. That's the difference. Maybe we'd rather be someplace lovely and exclusive and comfortable. We do prefer comfort and ease, and sometimes we demand it from God when he has something different for us. Um, You know, I think instead of yelling at God, we need to see those as opportunities to depend on him. I think when we yell at God because we're uncomfortable, when we determine we're in the wrong place, I think the only real evil is coming from our discontent hearts. So if you find yourself in a dry desert or in a downwardly financially mobile time, I want you to stop and consider, this is where God has directed me. This is where God has allowed my life to be right now. This is an opportunity to learn specifically about his personal care and his personal provision for me. 
Sadly, Israel fails the faith test in this dry desert again. And even more sadly to me, we're going to watch Moses and Aaron fail a leadership test. Begin reading with me in verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of the meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. So we immediately see God has a plan to give the people water. He's not going to let them die out there. And his plan is going to include watering their cattle also. But God's purpose here is greater than quenching their thirst. I want you to be very mindful of that. God's purpose is that they would learn about him. And what Moses and Aaron do here next, they're really thwarting God's purpose. Their their disobedience Uh, hinders the people from learning what they need to learn about God here. Pick the story back up in verse 10. And then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and he struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. This passage broke my heart. Maybe it did yours too. We quickly see Moses is irritated and impatient with the people. When he calls them rebels, I thought, oh, Moses, I've been waiting for you to do this. You should have called them rebels 10 chapters back. But that's me and my self-righteous, prideful side showing there. Moses shouldn't be yelling at the people. That's the first big red flag. The second big red flag is his words, shall we bring water out of this rock? We, he's implying Moses and Aaron there. The provision of water in the desert was evidence of God's care. It was evidence of God's power. It was evidence of God's provision for his people, not Moses and not Aaron's. The words we hear also show that Aaron is guilty. Aaron is participating in this um, angry outburst with Moses as well. And then Moses finalizes his disobedience by raising his staff. Instead of speaking to the rock, Moses strikes the rock twice. And I think it breaks my heart partly because I've just so esteemed Moses. I've so respected him and admired him. And I have to remember that God has esteemed and respected and admired Moses too. Look at what God had said about him, Numbers 12, 3. Now the man Moses was very meek or very humble, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And Numbers 12, 7, he is faithful in all my house. He's talking about Moses. With him, I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Moses perhaps is the most humble, the most faithful person who's ever walked on the face of the earth. And even Moses fails and falls short. And I don't know, maybe you did this. I wanted to make all kinds of excuses for him here. I wanted to say, those wretched people, they provoked him, Lord. And they did. And I want to say, well, he was compromised because his sister just died. And that's true. And I want to say, but his zeal for the Lord, he just wants the people to trust and obey. And that's true, too. But the other thing that's true is Moses is not holy. Moses is not righteous. Moses will never satisfy the holy, perfect standard of God. Even Moses falls short. Even Moses needs grace. And Moses probably needs grace constantly, just like all of us. His leadership task here was to make God look good, not to make Moses look good. The Amplified reads, you didn't sanctify me in the eyes of Israel. You didn't set me apart as holy in front of Israel's eyes. That was Moses' sin here, I believe. And it seems so harsh that now they'll be excluded from taking the people into the promised land because they've tolerated so much and they've done so much that is right up to this point. 
But I think we can really understand how they thwarted God's plan and God's purpose. I want you to look at these uh, verses out of Isaiah 41, beginning in verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water, that they may see and know, consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it. We can clearly see God had a purpose in showing them he was their provider. And Moses and Aaron have completely perverted God's purpose there. And that's disobedience. So why do we think um, God is including this chapter here? Why does God want us to understand that we are people who need his grace? Do you think it's because he wants us beating ourselves on the back and loathing who we are? I don't think that's it because that's not how God describes his feelings towards us. But I think God wants us to understand our constant need for grace, our constant inability to be holy because that's the only way we can really understand what grace is. If we think we're good enough for it, we don't really understand grace. If we think we can earn it because we're a little better than everybody else, we don't really understand grace. Our understanding is only complete when we see how inadequate even the best of us are. Standing in the presence of God, we don't measure up. Our failure and our inadequacy is the very best backdrop from which grace is displayed. And so I think that's why God shows us grace and then he shows us our need for grace here. So just like Moses, I think we have to remember we are God's child, we are God's friend. He does speak to us, but our human sinful spirit will remain inside us warring against God's spirit every day. Our desire will often be to put our glory and our fame over God's. We just have to know that. We have to rely on his grace and not our works. We have to perpetually remind ourselves to seek his glory and not our own. So even in Moses and Aaron's sin, did you notice that grace pours out? Grace pours out of the rock an abundance of water. The thirsty people are satisfied. Their animals are taken care of. And Moses and Aaron are disciplined here, and they do experience a serious consequence for their sin. But God does not lift his hand of grace off of Moses. Moses is forgiven. He's not cut off from God, and we know that because of the rest of Moses' story. We know that he continues to lead the people. He continues to experience the presence, the direction of God a little bit longer. And we know at the end of Moses' life, God himself is going to take him, and God is going to bury him. And about a thousand, more than a thousand years later, Hebrews 11 is going to be written. Hebrews 11 is called the Hall of Faith. And it's where the inspired words of God are commending people of faith. And you know who gets a lot of real estate in that chapter? Moses. Moses. God still loves Moses. God has not taken his hand of grace off of Moses. He's just allowing him to experience a consequence and a judgment here. And that's the beauty of grace. We can experience consequence, we can experience judgment, and we don't have to worry that God has taken his hand or his name or his presence away from us. Okay, what happens next, um, we're going to see a continuing, sadly, a continuing set of discouraging circumstances for Israel here, but in their discouraging events, we're also going to see that God's grace enters our discouragement. God's grace stays with us in our failures. I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit. Moses sends messengers to the king of Edom with a request, please allow Israel to pass through your land. Now, what is clear from this request is Moses is not planning to invade Canaan from the south. He's not going to enter the promised land from the south, perhaps, because that's the exact place where they tried to enter before when they charged in without God and they suffered a terrible defeat there. So the exact route that Moses is going to take is unknown to us, but we have some ideas. So I've given you a map in your handouts today and we're gonna put one up there on the screen and we're just gonna leave that map up so you can refer to it. Moses isn't planning on approaching from the south. He's, mo- he's planning on approaching from the east. 
And ultimately, he's going he's to get the children of Israel right there where the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. And you can see that on your map, right kind of in the center of the map there. You can also see that right now, they're at Kadesh, or Mount Hor. The most direct route to get them over there to the northern edge of the Dead Sea is to cut right through Edom and to get on the King's Highway. Do you see that there? So that's what Moses is trying to do. So he makes this request, and you need to know it's a big request to travel through someone's land. There are millions of people, and this is arid land, so you need to know that that many people moving through somebody's land could totally diminish all of their water supply. They could drain every well that they have. That many people moving through the land could trample every field and destroy miles and miles and miles of vegetation. And that many people traveling through the land could easily perhaps stir up a rebellion and overwhelm whoever has current control of the land. So considering all of those things, we can understand why it was a big request. Moses makes two very reasonable promises uh, to Edom two times. He says, we'll come through your land, we won't drink your water, we won't eat your food, we'll stay right on the roads. But Edom says no, and Edom actually shows up with a very hostile threat and an army. And they are denied the most direct access to the place they're trying to go. And I'm sure that was discouraging. From Kadesh, then they travel to Mount Hor. We don't quite know for certain Mount Hor's location, but you can see a spot there on the map that people suspect is the area. Many believe it's right there. And at Mount Hor, God says, let Aaron be gathered to his people here, for he shall not enter the land because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. So begin reading with me, chapter 20, verse 25. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up to Mount Hor and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar his son and Aaron shall be gathered to his people and shall die there. Moses did as the Lord commanded. Okay, so we're told that after Aaron dies here, all Israel mourns for 30 days, which was a great sign of respect and a great sign of grief for Aaron. You have to remember Aaron was Moses' brother, he was Moses' spokesperson, and Aaron was the first high priest for Israel, and his death was a huge loss. This was definitely a sign the last of the older generation are dying off, and we are told this is the fifth month of the 40th year. So clearly what we see here is God is continuing to execute his judgment for their disobedience, but God is also visibly demonstrating his grace here. To people who have trouble seeing with spiritual eyes, God is letting them see with their natural eyes as each of Aaron's priestly garments comes off of Aaron and is put on Eleazar. The white linen tunic, the blue ephod, the breastplate, remember, with jewels that represented each individual tribe of Israel. That's placed on Eleazar, and the people see very quickly the role of the high priest will continue. God is not leaving the people without a mediator. And that is a phenomenal blessing and grace to them. So let's talk about what the high priest does. Let's remind ourselves the priest would bear witness to God's love and would instruct the people. I think most importantly, the priest would serve as the mediator, offering sacrifices in obedience to God so that they could be cleaned. Um, Remember, we have such a visual picture last week in the midst of that plague as everyone is dying. What is the high priest doing? He's running among the dying people, offering a sacrifice so that people will live. He's standing between the people and God, speaking on their behalf. That's the role of the high priest. And God is never leaving his people without a mediator because of his grace. That role would continue. And, you know, we have to stop and consider God does the same thing for us today. He has not left us without a mediator. We're so like Israel. We're traveling people. We're every day going to God. We're trying to live from our new identity. And God has given us a mediator. In Jesus, he's given us a savior who offered himself as the perfect sacrifice But Jesus continues to serve us in a priestly role, intervening for us, being our mediator. Look at 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ has entered into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
And I love that picture. It's such a gracious picture, even in our sin, even in our failure. God continues to provide a mediator for us, going to God on our behalf. I want you to picture the perfect Savior Son sits beside the powerful Holy Father, and from time to time, he says, Father, can you help my sister? In my name, will you do it? And grace flows to us from the Father. That's a picture for you to carry of Jesus as your mediator, and it's such a picture of grace, especially for people who will always need God's forgiveness. We're going to pick the story back up in verse 4, chapter 21 of verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and he set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. All right, what, what I think is significant here, and it isn't, doesn't become evident just in that first quick reading, they head out to go around Edom, and this is why I want you to have your map, because I want you to understand what a terribly discouraging change of direction this was for the people. Look at your maps. They're at Kadesh or Mount Hor. They're right there on the southern edge of the promised land. And I have to wonder if on a clear day they could go up high and actually see the promised land. That's how close they are. And God's direction, what comes to them through Moses in the cloud, says, turn around and go the other way. Put the promised land behind you and walk toward the desert my hand would be raised up high with him. I would be so frustrated in that moment. I'm not sure that I could have been faithful and obedient. Their complaint rises up. It's not just a complaint against Moses this time. It's a complaint um, expressed to God as well. You brought us out here to die. That is an assault on the promise and the word of God. There's no food and water. That's a lie, and it's an assault on God's daily provision for them. We hate this worthless food. That's an assault against God's personal care for them. You know, worthless in this context means miserable and contemptible. And so slow down and consider those words. God has been miraculously dropping food from the sky for these people every morning for 40 years. They have been completely nourished without having to plant or tend or harvest any crops. They have been completely fed without having to hunt, kill, or butcher any animals. And in that situation, they say what God has provided is miserable and contemptible. And I so want to say, oh, those wretched Israelites. But then I stop and I say, do I ever complain about God's provision? And within 30 seconds, literally, of my asking that question, God gives me a couple examples. You know, I have a a lovely home in a safe neighborhood, and I know it's God's provision because he gave it to me during my economic downturn. And yet, every day when I sit in the traffic on Brian Irvin... I say, I hate having to drive down this road every day. (laughs) I do it. And I'm going to share something else with you. God has given me a healthy body. And for 53 years, I've lived free of disability, free of disease, free of any major health issue. But almost every single day, I have a moment when I look in the mirror and I say out loud, I hate my body. I hate the way I look. I hate my frizzy hair. I hate my short, fat legs. And I could go on and on and on, but we're not going to do that today. When I complain about God's provision, just like Israel, I assault and degrade and diminish the reality that the awesome God of the universe pays attention to me. He cares for me. He provides for me. 
What we can learn from this encounter here is God wants to give us all that we need, but he expects us to receive it with gratitude. This attack on God and his provision provokes fierce and immediate anger from God, fierce and immediate judgment from God. It's another great teaching moment. He sends these poisonous snakes that bite the people and many die. And then we see something new, something hopeful from the Israelites. We see godly sorrow, we see repentance. They recognize that they're sinning by speaking against God and they ask for mercy. And God graciously paves the way for the people to be rescued from the judgment they deserve. They deserve to be bitten by snakes and they deserve to die in this instant. But God rescues them. He tells Moses, fashion a serpent out of bronze and put it on a pole and hold it up high for the people. And anyone who's bitten by a snake, when he looks to the serpent, he will live. Okay, to, to see, when he sees the serpents, to see means to look with faith, to look with belief. So the bronze serpent here is not an idol. The bronze serpent is a symbol. And the serpent isn't magical, and the serpent doesn't heal them. God does. God can, God wants to, and God does. But the people have to first exercise obedient faith, don't they? God has made a way for them to be rescued, but if they want to live, they have to be obedient to God's plan. They have to lift their eyes in faith and gaze on that symbol. And this is teaching us something powerful and profound, and this is preparing the whole world to receive God's grace when it would come later through the person of his son, Jesus. The cross is God's symbol today. We're all under God's judgment for our own personal sin, but Jesus has suffered our penalty and Jesus has won our victory. But each one of us has to be willing to lift our eyes to Jesus on the cross and in faith we receive God's rescue. He offers it to every single one of us. John 3, 14 says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Ephesians 2, I think, describes us just like snake bit Israelites. Listen to what it says. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We were all fatally snake bit, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So chapter 21 will go on to describe their route all the way around Edom and up into Moab. You can see where that is on your map. Many of the names and locations that are listed here in these passages can't be identified with certainty today, but we can discern some of the known sites, and we know they're making their way around the east here. They do reach the area on the northeastern edge of the Dead Sea. So you can see the Dead Sea up there on your map. They're directly across from Jericho, those of you who know how the story's gonna play out. So begin reading with me, uh, chapter Chapter 21 in verse 21. Then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We will not turn aside into field or vineyard. We will not drink the water of a well. We will go by the king's highway until we have passed through your territory. But Sion would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. He gathered all his people together and went out against Israel to the wilderness. Excuse me. He gathered all his people together and went out against Israel to the wilderness and came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel defeated him with the edge of the sword. And Israel took possession of his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok as far to the Ammonites, for the border of the Ammonites was strong. And Israel took all these cities, and Israel settled in all of the cities of the Amorites in Hezbon and in all its villages." Okay, where they are right now, it's considered the plains of Moab, and your map says Moab, but it certainly appears that Moab is actually under the control of Sion, the Amorite. And most likely, Sion has come in and defeated Moab, and that's why he's in control of this territory. So Sion, just like Edom, refuses them passage, refuses them access to the king's highway, and Sion does attack Israel. But something remarkable happens. The tide begins to change for Israel now. 
Israel defeats Sion and takes possession of this land. And ladies, I want you to look at those rivers. They take all the land between the Arnon and the Jabbok River. And they settle there. And I kept reading those words thinking, why isn't that in bold? Why aren't there exclamation points all over that? These people have been waiting for so long for their land and they are conquering and taking land right now. Here's what they don't know yet. They are very focused on the land to the west of the Jordan River, that land called Canaan, because God has promised that to them. But this land that they are conquering right now in the future, it will become their territory also. They just don't know it yet. We're told that they go a little further northeast. They capture a major city called Hazor. Then read with me what happens next in verse 33. Then they turned and they went up by the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against them, he and all his people, to battle at Edre. But the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him, for I have given him into your hand, and all his people and his land, and you shall do to him as you did to Sion, king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So they defeated him and his sons and all his people until he had no survivor left, and they possessed his land." All the way up, all the way up in Gilead and Bashan, Israel is possessing this land. And God is going with them. And God is encouraging them the words, I've given him into your hands already. God has done it. And God is encouraging them, don't fear. And it all played out exactly as God said it would. And there are those words again, they possessed the land. I lived in those cities. And I want to tell you, I've been here. Some of you have been here too. This land is lush and beautiful and well watered. This is where the headwaters of the Jordan River are. It looks nothing like the desert land that they have spent the last 40 years in. So after 40 years of corrective discipline, the tide begins to turn and God begins to accomplish his great promise that he first uttered to Abraham, I'll make you a nation. I'll give you a land, and I will bless you. Israel conquers, possesses, and occupies that entire Transjordan territory there, and this would be incredibly helpful and encouraging to them. The land would become their staging area as they prepare to cross the Jordan and attack Canaan and take all of that territory. These preliminary um, uh, successes here, these would be encouraging evidence for them that God is faithful to his promise. God does fight for us. God has done this for us already. It's evidence that God's grace goes with them and enables them to accomplish his plans. And this would certainly stir confidence and hope in the hearts of people who are so inclined to fear and doubt. That was all such God's blessing and his grace to them. I want you to put that next map up next. As if all those things is not enough, at a later date, they will request this land in addition to the territory that they claim all in Canaan. And God is going to give it to them. In their future, this land will become the allotment for the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half of Manasseh. They are winning the prize that God has promised in this moment. Now, I don't know if you've been keeping a tally sheet of Israel's high moments and her low moments. If you have, you might be considering Israel hasn't exactly earned these successes. Israel hasn't really performed to a level that we would expect God to bless them in this way. It's only God's grace that makes this possible. God is fulfilling his promises and accomplishing his plans through Israel because of grace. So if this is a theology lesson, not a history lesson, we can all stop and ask, what is God teaching me? He's definitely teaching me. He is an unchanging, forever constant, holy God of grace. He's also teaching me that I am a changing, rebellious, inconstant person who will always need grace. You know, I stay pretty frustrated with myself. I'm a bit of a perfectionist by nature, and I've been walking with God for about 40 years, and sometimes I mistakenly think I should be pretty sinless by now. I really should have mastered this sin thing, and I'm thinking that, and then something horribly ugly stirs up in my mouth, and it shows in my heart, and then it shows up on my face, and it blurts out my mouth, 
and maybe it's a complaint or an unkind word or an ugly statement, and I am so defeated and discouraged and I'm crushed. And here's what I've learned from this. Of course, my sin should break my heart and draw me to God, but I don't think it should surprise me. I really don't think I should expect to be sinless yet. Um, My sinful heart will continue to struggle with God's spirit inside me until I get to the promised land where God is waiting for me. We're on the same path as Israel. We're going to God. We're learning to live like his new identity. We will not become sinless or holy this side of heaven, but grace will stay with us and grace will pave the way. Let's pray. God, you are a good God, and we thank you for your love and your care and your provision for us. We pray that we can um, grow to receive all that you give us as a gift from your hand and to trust you and to obey you, Lord. You are gracious, and we don't deserve it, so we humbly thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.